By any standard, flying on a commercial airliner is a relatively safe form of travel. Dr. Arnold Barnett of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology determined that the fatality risk of a commercial airline flight between 1978 and 1987 was just one in some 750,000 boardings. But that doesn't mean that things couldn't go wrong. I mean, your flight might run into bad weather. There might be a mechanical issue with your plane. There might even be pilot error or for the 274 passengers and crew of China Air Flight 006 on February 19th, 1985. All of the above. That terrifying time when a 747 fell 30,000 feet in just under two and a half minutes is history that deserves to be remembered. The first Boeing 747 rolled off the assembly plant on September 30th, 1968. The result of a request by Pan American Airlines to create a larger jet that would reduce per seat cost and democratize air travel. The 747 was the first designed to be called a jumbo jet. 230 foot, 10 inches long, the 747 is a quad jet that is powered by four jet engines. The plane could accommodate as many as 550 passengers, although it is typically configured to carry 366 in what was at the time an unprecedented 10 abreast seating. The aircraft's iconic hump allowed a raised cockpit. This was with an eye towards the future of air travel. At the time, it was assumed that passenger jets would be superseded by supersonic transports, and the raised cockpit would allow an easy conversion of the 747 design to become a freighter airplane by installing a front cargo door. It wasn't necessary. The 747 would outlive the era of the SST. The design proved to be rugged and popular. The first 747 entered service with Pan American Airlines in 1970, and production continues today. Boeing currently plans to halt construction in 2022, more than a half century after the 747 first took to the skies, with more than 1,500 built. The 747 has garnered an exceptional safety record, with few accidents related to aircraft construction or design over millions of flight hours. The plane is so reliable that two modified versions are used by the United States Air Force to transport the President, although the designation Air Force One actually is used to designate any aircraft carrying the President rather than a specific plane. Modified versions of the 747 were also used by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to transport space shuttle orbiters. The heavily modified 747-100s were called Space Carrier Aircrafts, or SCAs. By the early 1970s, the 747 was facing competition from trijet wide-bodied aircraft, the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 and Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. In response to requests from Pan American Airlines and Iran Air, Boeing developed a shorter version of the 747 that would offer greater range and higher cruising speed for the ultra-long-range routes, such as Iran Air's nonstop from New York to Tehran. By modifying the 747, Boeing would have a competitor for the DC-10 and L-1011. Originally, the plane was going to be called the 747-SB, meaning short-bodied, but the name was changed to 747-SP, meaning special performance, recognizing the plane's greater range and cruising speed. The most noticeable change was the length. The 747-SP is 47 feet shorter than other 747 models, although the tail is also higher to compensate for the decrease in yaw moment arm resulting from the shortened fuselage. The SP could accommodate 230 passengers in a three-class cabin, 331 in a two-class cabin, and a maximum of 400 passengers in one class. The first 747 SP was delivered to Pan American Airlines on March 5, 1976. While the design was promising, new competing aircraft and rising fuel costs meant that it did not achieve the popularity that Boeing hoped, and only 45 were built. 747 SP-9N4522V first flew in June of 1982. On February 19, 1985, the plane, which was owned by the Wilmington Trust Company of Wilmington, Delaware, and leased by China Air, was flying a regularly scheduled route between Taipei, Taiwan, and Los Angeles, California, a flight of about 11 hours. China Air Flight 6 was using the call sign Dynasty 006. The plane was carrying 251 passengers and 23 crew. The air crew were experienced. The captain, 55-year-old Min Wan Ho, had more than 15,500 flight hours with more than 3,700 of those on the Boeing 747. First Officer Zhu Yue Chang, age 53, had more than 7,700 flight hours, with more than 4,500 of those on the 747. Rounding out the crew was Flight Engineer Ku Pin Wei, age 55. 
because of the length of the flight, additional crew, Relief Captain Qin Yuan Lao and Relief Flight Engineer Shi Lung Su were also aboard. The relief crew would pilot the plane during cruise flight, allowing the primary flight crew to rest. Most of the flight proceeded without incidents, and at about 10 a.m. local time off the coast of California, some 320 nautical miles northwest of San Francisco, the main crew was back at the controls. The problem started with simple turbulence. The plane was on autopilot, and as wind speeds caused the speed to fluctuate, the autopilot compensated by moving the throttles. As the airspeed slowed, the autopilot increased the throttle to maintain airspeed. As it increased, it decreased throttle. The next time it went to increase throttle, the numbers 1, 2, and 3 engines responded, but the flight engineer noticed in a gauge that the fourth engine was not increasing power. The engineer then tried manually throttling the Pratt & Whitney JT9D-78 turbofan engine. While the captain could feel nothing peculiar, the gauges continued to show that engine 4 was not responding. Flight engineer Wei told the captain that the engine 4 had flamed out, meaning that the flame had been extinguished in the combustion chamber and would have to be restarted. The plane was at 41,000 feet, and according to the book, the maximum altitude to attempt a restart was 30,000 feet. Captain Ho ordered First Officer Chang to request a lower flight level from ground control, but also instructed Engineer Wei to attempt to restart the engine anyway. The restart failed. The crew had already made a critical mistake. The National Transportation Safety Board later determined that Engine 4 had not flamed out. The engine had been written up before for having an occasional problem with not providing enough thrust. The problem had to do with a fuel control valve, which had worn down slightly, slowing fuel input into the engine and causing sluggish acceleration. The problem was small and should not have created a major problem. But the engine throttling to maintain airspeed had created a large issue with something called bleed air. Bleed air is pressure that is diverted from the engines and used to pressurize the cabin and power the air conditioning. While those functions are necessary, bleed air reduces airflow through the engine, thus reducing its ability to produce thrust. As the fourth engine accelerated more slowly than the other three, its bleed air valve was held open larger than the other three, and the engine, already having difficulty, took on a higher percentage of the bleed air load. The engine had not flamed out, but was rather hung. The problem likely would have been fixed immediately if Wei had followed the checklist for restart, which included closing the bleed air valves. But Wei missed a step in the checklist, and the engine remained hung. This still should not have been catastrophic. The 747 could operate on three engines, but a larger problem was developing. As engine number four was not producing power, the plane was dealing with asymmetric thrust. The left wing was producing more thrust than the right. This would naturally cause the plane to bank right, as the left wing would produce more lift. However, the problem was not obvious, as the autopilot was compensating for the difference. But the autopilot of the period only had control over the ailerons, not the rudder, and the yaw was slowly pushing the plane farther over than the autopilot could correct. The plane was slowly banking, rolling over right, but the problem was essentially being masked by the autopilot. Captain Ho was apparently focused on the flight engineer and what was going on with the number four engine, and that problem with the banking went unnoticed until it showed in airspeed. As the plane banked, increasing drag and the power reduced from engine 4, the plane began to decelerate. Not realizing the underlying problem, Captain Ho changed the autopilot input, and was selecting a nose-down attitude in order to increase airspeed, which seemed to be the biggest problem. As the plane nosed down, the bank increased to 45 degrees, but Captain Ho, still most focused on airspeed, decided to switch off the autopilot and take control of the plane. Switching off the autopilot was a move that blogger Admiral Cloudberg, who described himself as an analyzer of plane crashes, noted would have immediate and catastrophic consequences. The NTSB report indicated that after Ho disengaged the autopilot, the plane yawed and rolled further right. Cloudberg speculates that when the autopilot disengaged, it stopped applying the aileron inputs that were attempting to counteract the bank, causing the plane to roll immediately right. At this point, the website This Day in Aviation explains the airplane departed controlled flight, rolled over, and dived. Cloudberg noted the 747 began to lose altitude at an alarming rate as it rolled clear over on its roof, catching the pilots completely by surprise. But then the plane had moved into clouds, and without reference points, both the captain and the first officer became disoriented. The attitude gauges were spinning, but the captain could not accurately perceive what was going on and assumed that they must have failed, as what they showed would have been so irregular. Flight recordings indicated the plane was inverted, but the crew did not realize it or note it. While in the cabin, objects flew around. One passenger described the people not buckled in, popping up like popcorn. Relief Captain Lau had been thrown from his bunk, was trying to make it his way to his, the cockpit. And the San Francisco Examiner reported that he was thrown to the floor as the jumbo jet dived, mighty G-forces immobilizing him. 
The paper went on. With 440,000 pounds of metal and flesh hurtling out of the sky, the altimeters went wild and made small change out of the precious capital of height and safety. Cloudberg explained, In just 33 seconds, Flight 006 plunged 10,000 feet as the pilots fought to regain control. As the plane approached 30,000 feet, it rapidly rolled over level and began to pull up, subjecting the occupants to a soul-crushing, face-melting 4.8 vertical Gs. And then, after executing a full 360-degree aileron roll, the 747 slowed down to less than 100 knots, possibly stalling the airplane, before it rolled hard to the right and entered a second, even steeper plunge. Flight engineer Wei, his head pinned to the central control panel by the G-forces and unable to move his arms, yelled that the other three engines had failed. Actually, Captain Ho had throttled them back, trying to slow the descent, but Wei could not lift his head to see the gauges. The plane was beginning to break up, its main landing gear being ripped from its mountings and tearing off the gear doors. The NTSB reported, the two inboard main gear struts were left dangling. Large parts of the horizontal stabilizer were torn off. The airplane lost 30,000 feet in altitude in less than two and a half minutes. The plane broke through the bottom of the clouds at approximately 11,000 feet. Captain Ho, finally with a point of reference, was able to orient himself, the examiner explained. The 747 broke out of the clouds at 11,000 feet, and the captain, aided at last by visual references, began to see which way was up. He slowly regained control and stabilized the machine. By then, the number four engine had actually flamed out, but the crew was able to restart it normally. The crew took the plane back to a safer altitude and, almost miraculously, intended to continue to Los Angeles as planned. However, they realized that the inboard landing gear was down, causing drag, and one of the hydraulic systems had been drained, apparently when the entire left outboard elevator had been torn off, along with its actuator. Ho declared an emergency and requested permission to land immediately in San Francisco. Shockingly, there were only two serious injuries aboard the plane. A crew member had badly strained their back, and one of the passengers had broken their foot. When the pilots regained control of the plane, the passengers cheered. One of them told the press, I really thought... That was it. The NTSB report noted several errors by the crew, noting that Captain Ho was distracted first by the evaluation of the engine malfunction and second by his attempts to arrest the decreasing airspeed, and that because of these distractions he was unable to assess properly and promptly the approaching loss of airplane control. He may have over-relied on the autopilot. In many ways, the accident aboard Dynasty 006 represents the combination of human fallibility and automation which reduces pilots to mere gauge watchers. Flying Magazine noted in October 1986 that China Air Flight 6 graphically shows what a misalliance the marriage of man and computer can sometimes be. Yet somehow, both pilot and machine managed to survive, something that the examiner credits to the structural soundness and aerodynamic capabilities of the 747. The newspaper quotes Jeffrey Wilkinson, the former head of the British Air Accident Investigation Branch. The way that 747 was handled, it had no God-given right not to break up. And on paper, the people aboard had no right to survive. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.